We are going to try to, this is on your sheet, it tells you what you're supposed to do in this unit. This is called the notes. Kind of was supposed to be done originally on the back of the pink sheet, or blue sheet, this is blue, right? Uh, but you know what I said? I said, hey, you don't want to have to write out all that stuff, so I basically made a little template and you just get to fill in the blanks as we go through it. Um, the other one that some of you were asking me about is this one you picked up right at the beginning. This originally was a PowerPoint, but now on Dunamis, it is a Bobby Talks. And you basically go through the little video and you fill in the blanks. I'll show you one page of it. This is the one page that includes section 5.3 because you were supposed to basically go through and realize that a change in state or form does not actually change one substance to another. So if you happen to have that sheet in front of you, you would say does not. And then I mentioned the most important diagram maybe in this chapter is this puppy right here. Um, words like deposition, sublimation, melting, solidification, evaporation, condensation, um, on Dynamis. There's a bunch of little videos on all of these changes of state. I don't have time to show you them all in class, but you know what? You guys are sitting around at home with nothing to do, right? So I just figure, hey, sometime you want to watch an incredible movie on change of state. Sit your parents down and say, Mommy, look at this. Watch this with me. Anyhow, physical changes are usually reversible. Chemical changes result in new substances. Um, the point of me showing you this diagram right now, though, even though this is available on the Bobby Talks on Dynamis, is that I mentioned that sublimation involved the solid going directly to a gas without going through the liquid stage. If I have a block of ice right here in my hand, it would be dripping on my face because it would go through the liquid phase before it ever evaporated into a gas. But I thought, because I love you, that I would give you an actual, actually show you an example of sublimation because it's so much better if you actually see this rather than me just mumble about it, right? So um, we've all met dry ice before. At some point in your long-legged life, hello camera, I'm down here. This is dry ice, right? So, no, don't touch it. Uh, speaking of, this, this stuff, you know that ice, what, at what temperature does ice melt? Zero. Zero degrees Celsius, yes. Um, this freezes at minus 79 degrees Celsius. So in other words, it's cold, but I can't pick it up. So we'll just kind of play hockey with it. Wow. It's an iceberg. You know how PA you can't dance, right? Because eh? that's simple. So we're going to show you this incredible, these, this is called a quarter, right? So I'm going to make the quarter dance, shame on it. But you see all those vapors coming off there? See, is that magic? That's magic. But it's not magic. So you have to come up with some rational explanation for why it's moving. Yeah, but where does it get the energy? You know what? You, you people are geniuses. Very good. You got uh, basically sublimation, right, taking place on both sides of it. It's pushing the gas on both sides. So it goes back and forth. You know what? You can't dance alone, right? Here is a friend of the opposite sex. I should have sprint myself. Oh, the other one. It's melting. Now they're cold, and I can't touch them. So I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, you don't see any liquid carbon dioxide here, right? So we are going to pretend that this is a mad scientist's laboratory, which it kind of is, right? So, um, because I can't think of anything else to do with it. Oh, blood. Oh. Very sad. I think I'm going to, first of all, clean that up because right now it bothers me. Can't have things bothering me. Um, okay, I know. You know how uh, carbon dioxide is supposed to put out fires? 
cold quarter. Um, we are going to put out a fire. But in order to put out a fire, we have to make one first. So, just in case you are stuck without a fire extinguisher someday, just grab a piece of good dry ice. By the way, we have a place that sells dry ice just down the street here. So, Port Kells, if you ever need some for a, this is called a double whammy match. It's a mutant. It didn't stay lit because carbon dioxide basically chokes out the oxygen. So if we pour the carbon dioxide out of this, I know that's thrilling, people. I know it's thrilling. Um, this is supposed to... Uh, we're supposed to move on to that sheet. I need to... You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to put it in the bag like this. Anyhow, tomorrow, I promise. Um, this is obviously cold, 97 degrees. Tomorrow, how about 196? Uh, liquid nitrogen, so I'll bring in some of that. And then you can really experience what cold is. The important thing right now is that you realize that sublimation is going from a solid to a gas. And if you take a gas, carbon dioxide, and you compress it, go directly into a solid. That's called deposition. Hello. How do you do that? Like, what's an example of that? When they make dry ice, they actually take carbon dioxide from a cylinder, and then they just compress it, and it goes directly into a solid. You had a question, sir. You know what? It's melting so fast. This is very, very cold water, right? And so if you left it in there long enough, it would actually freeze the water. But uh, we're not going to leave it in there long enough. I just had this ingenious idea. To speed up the process, right? Let's make a little pot of tea. Porte. Welcome to Stevenson's Laboratory of Madness. There we go. Okay. Mm. Is this this is the time for the photo shoot people? <coughs> Not now, just yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just figured, you know what, sublimation, you need to see it. You can't just, you know, the word doesn't mean anything, right? So we'll move on. Now that I've been moving around, this is going to be really exciting for you, I know. Um, that sheet that you picked up, or that, that I gave you with the Erlenmeyer flask, you are beginning a unit on chemistry. So what I said to myself is, self, um, we need to go through a few of these. So this is old-fashioned. This is called an overhead projector. We've got to turn that off so you can actually see it. Basically, when you say what is a chemical, all matter is made up of chemicals. So you'll notice on the lovely little sheet, all matter is made up of chemicals, right? Um, anything that has mass and volume is a chemical. They would include solids, they would include liquids, and they would include gases, right? So, I don't think I've told you anything terribly new there. So, uh, moving right along. What are chemicals like? Everybody have one of these? Anybody need one? Sally, you all right? Sally, Sally, Sally. Sally? Do you need one? Come. Very good. There you go. That's all right. Okay, moving right along. Hello. Truly. Call you Sally. Sorry. It's been a long time. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Shirley. Um, what are chemicals like? Chemicals are described by their characteristics or properties. These properties can describe a whole lot of physical things, like what's its appearance, its smell, its weight, etc. Um, yeah, so you all got properties, things like appearance, smell, mass, list five more physical properties. So I'm thinking for physical properties. I don't know if you mentioned things like uh, its color. Color would be a good one. 
Uh, what is it actually? It's, it's hardness. Like, is it as hard as a diamond or is it soft like talc? Uh, is it lustrous? Is it shiny? And then you can describe something by what it does, not just what it is physically. For instance, does it burn in oxygen? Does it glow in the dark? Does it sing Jesus loves me? Does it evaporate? So those are basically what chemicals are like. Um, the rest of chapter 5 is about classification of matter. And this is where it gets kind of messy. So classification of matter, there are five types of matter. And we break them into two categories, pure substances and mixtures. So by the time we do this, your right hand will be sore. That's all right. Um, so again, five types of matter. We're going to put them in five little boxes here. The five little boxes are essentially pure substances. Anybody hear strange noise other than the bubble, bubble, bubble? <coughs> wow. I think it's the devil. It's in the drawer. It's alive. There's a game called Taboo, eh? Okay. Good. Uh, anyhow, elements made up of only one kind of atom. So when we talk about pure substances, we're talking essentially about two types of things. They're either an element or a compound. The elements are the easiest ones to determine because, here's the secret, if it's on this chart, the periodic table, it's a bloody element. So somebody asked me if gold was an element. AU. Gold. So it's an element. You can't divide gold up into anything other than gold, right? If I divide it in half and then half again and half again, all I'm going to ever have is gold atoms. They are the same. Notice we have given you the name, and then we give you the actual symbol on the periodic table. The next chapter is about memorizing about 30 of those. Maybe you did that in middle school already, but just for now, AU comes from the Latin aurum. AG comes from the Latin argentum, silver. Hydrogen is just capital H, that one's easy. Iron, Latin, ferrum. Those are all elements. Anyhow, um, if I take an element like sodium, which is a metal, whoa, maybe I have some down here. Okay, this is sodium in oil has to be kept in oil because if you put it in water it explodes so if you get a big piece of it and you stick it in your neighbor's swimming pool then you can blow up their swimming pool it's so exciting anyhow you'll notice that sodium is here on the periodic table all of these this family the alkaline metals actually becomes more explosive with water as you go down so by the time you get to like cesium don't even breathe on it because the water vapor in it does nasty things right so but the funny thing is, if I take this sodium and I put it in a gas called chlorine gas, green gas, like mustard gas, um, we get a bunch of sparks. And at the bottom of the glass container, we get a whole lot of things called salt crystals. And then the salt crystals, I can just put on my tomato and I can eat it. So when you put two elements together in fixed proportions, they can actually combine and have different properties. So I mentioned salt is the combination of one atom of sodium, one atom of chlorine to make a compound sodium chloride with totally different properties, totally edible. Right. I have to justify the fact that I spent money on this this morning, right? So I have to keep this going while we're going here. So. <coughs> Anybody happen to see what I did with nice little tongs? Because I'm not about to touch it with my fingers. No, no, no. Oh well. Very interesting. Okay. Um, the most typical example that you all know of a compound is water. Again, you have an explosive gas, hydrogen, and another gas. If we have them bubbling together in a test tube and we stick a little piece of glowing wood in there, a wood splint, it goes pop, 
and then you get little droplets of water, those two gases together, totally different properties because you can drink water. Anyhow, uh, we said that matter was classified into five groups. The other group is a mixture, and mixtures can be solutions. Let's see where solutions are. Solutions, particles of at least two substances mixed together completely. It's a fancy word for that, homogeneous on your page. And that basically, two examples I can think of is, like when you put salt in water, you can't see the salt particles anymore. You have a solution. It's completely dissolved. Same thing with Kool-Aid. God forbid that you should actually drink the stuff. But hey, uh, all manner of interesting colored dyes in that and artificial flavors. Matter of fact, if you can stay away from processed foods altogether, that's better yet. It's singing. Wow. What's that? Is that the ice? That was, yeah, the dry ice just doing the same thing as the quarter did. This is probably not good for electronic equipment, you yeah? mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, And just because I can... What would happen if you put it in water? It's just the metal vibrating like the quarter was. I feel better now. Okay, um, moving right along, would I explode? Probably, yeah, and I'm not going to demonstrate that no matter how much you want me to, I don't want to explode today, so. Um, if you swallow things like, <laughs> it actually burns your skin, right? Yeah, so, you don't mind. Well, if you have it in your stomach, all that gas is going to increase in your stomach and basically, Anyhow, uh, we got as far as solutions, there is something called a suspension. Ladies and gentlemen, a suspension is when particles of one substance stay partly clumped together. They don't really dissolve. Um, my typical example is stuff like tomato juice. I used to have to go over to my grandma's on Sunday after church, and she would have little glasses and she would pour tomato juice in them, and it would sit there for like half an hour, and this tomato juice would separate into this yellow layer on top, and then this ketchup-like stuff on the bottom, and then she expected me to drink it. That's like almond butter. Yeah. Well, I don't like that either. So there you go. Um, anyhow, the point is, things like starch in water, you may have read that Dr. Seuss book on oobleck or whatever, fog, all of these are suspensions where something is floating around in a solvent, but it doesn't actually dissolve. Anyhow, the fifth type of matter is a mechanical mixture. Particles of different substances making up a mechanical mixture can be separated fairly easily based on just visual characteristics like size, color, shape. My example would be a bunch of granola that has like raisins in it, walnuts, oatmeal. You can physically see those particles and you can actually separate them. So granola, Smarties, you can separate the red ones from the brown ones. You don't want to eat the brown ones. How about that example I mentioned on your test with salt and sand? Wow. I, see, I can't say it. Based on other properties than the visual characteristics, you could separate salt and white sand. Anyhow, now is your turn, ladies and gentlemen. For one million dollars and a purple Ferrari, see if you can uh, just try those on your own and then we'll quickly go over those. Tin, gravel, seawater, sugar. Classify them as, are they going to be either an element Mechanical mixture, compound, solution, suspension, right? So, yeah, so remember the five classification groups we had? We had elements, we have compounds, solution, suspension, or mechanical mixture. So you have to tell me whether tin is one of those. It is one of those. Anyhow, raisin brand. One of the highest fiber cereals you can get, people. It's good for you. God bless you. There are raisins in that stuff. You could pick them out by hand. Mechanical mixture. Ladies and gentlemen, oxygen. There it is, periodic table. So it happens to be an element. 
and nobody, nobody gets this one right. Are you just guessing or what? Mr. Barlin, that is incredible. Anyhow, steel is what's called an alloy, and alloys are solutions of one metal in another one. So depending on how much carbon and iron you have combined to make carbon steel, steel is actually a solution. Uh, for those of you whose hand is falling off, you should know that we're moving on and it's not going to be as painful anymore. We can make it happen. Okay, chemical change. Wow. Here it comes. Chemical change can either be physical, where nothing new is produced, okay. and the physical change is often reversible. I think I've given you an example. If you've watched any of those Bobby Talks things yet, you will notice that in, on the Bobby Talks, I take a piece of paper and I go like this. Physical change, right? Physical change, because I could tape that back together. I could, if I really wanted to, make it look almost the same. But if Stevenson, in his madness, takes a match, could be interesting. And I actually decide to burn my homework. There you go, teacher. There's my homework. Um, that paper, this is not reversible, this reaction. I can't make this go backwards. I cannot ever get the paper back. And so that is a chemical change. Something new is produced. In this case, carbon. Carbon dioxide. It's not reversible. Right. Um, so examples of chemical changes would be burning wood, paper, things like rusting. If I stick iron outside and there's water around, I can actually turn iron, the metal, into iron oxide rust totally loses all structural soundness, bridge collapses, etc. if it rusts. Monsieur? Melting ice is physical, is physical right? Isn't, that, isn't like copper being outside that's still chemical change? Copper um, doesn't rust, right? It's only iron. Yeah, it's reacting with oxygen, right? So in that blueness is copper oxide. That's very good. So if you look at the Hotel Vancouver, it used to be a really shiny copper roof. But now if you go downtown, you see this big green roof. That's, as the dear lady points out, copper, the element reacting with oxygen in the air to form copper chloride and a few other compounds, which happen to be green. So um, there's a thing on the computer when you do your lovely little purple sheet. It is called chemistry, chemical change, right? Um, there's a Bobby Talks that explain what happens with that because most of you, when you go into it, you have to drag your mouse and drop the little pointer right on the little bucket. Yeah, but you got to just drop the pointer on the bucket, not the word. Eh? Watch the Bobby Talks first, and then it'll work for you. I promise, I promise. Make it work for you. Anyhow, um, so you try it. Physical or chemical change. What do you think if I had a firecracker and I was looking for one today and I couldn't find one? Is that a physical or chemical? Chemical, God bless you. Yes, you cannot reverse that reaction. You cannot suddenly, all that sound, bang, make it reverse and come back. Um, sugar dissolving in water, physical, yeah. We could evaporate the water and have the sugar. This one may surprise you. If you spill bleach on your genes, you actually end up with a permanent change to your genes that are no, no longer reversible. It's actually a chemical change. So I have a couple of last definitions for you here. Um, we are doing chemistry. In chemistry, you have reactants, the things you start with. So a reactant, in a chemical reaction, what you start with is the reactant. And I give you an example. I say, for instance, magnesium, and the symbol is just capital MG. Maybe I should find a piece of magnesium for you. Hmm. Yeah. I will find a piece of magnesium, and then we can actually show you this. And then we will hold the magnesium like this. Okay. 
Um, so this is magnesium. Normally when you do chemical reactions with magnesium, you actually take sandpaper or steel wool and you rub all this stuff off the outside because like copper, uh, it actually reacts with oxygen in the air and forms magnesium oxide on the outside. But I can make it react with oxygen faster by burning it. Okay, if you value your retina of your eye, you don't actually stare at this because it is exceptionally bright, eh? But Uh, I don't know. God. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, I'm not looking. No, I'm not looking. Totally not looking. Oh my goodness. Anyhow, that's magnesium oxide forming. Do you know that when, if you collect all this powder at the bottom, it actually weighs more than the metal in the first place? Okay, that was hot. You actually see that when you wake up in the morning? Wow. Anyhow, um, so products, on the other hand, are chemicals that are produced in a chemical reaction. I said magnesium and oxygen were the reactants. So how you show this is a chemical equation. You actually draw it magnesium plus oxygen. Notice that there's two atoms of oxygen when anything reacts with oxygen. So you put a little subscript down to the right lower side, O2, magnesium plus oxygen gas gives. So you just draw an arrow. Magnesium oxide, a compound. Are you excited or what? That's awesome. Okay, I think we have one last page and it's probably the most important. We need to be able to decide on what is a chemical and what is a basically the evidence for chemical change. So, last page, I promise, and then I will shut up. Here it comes. Um, so, if we carry out some kind of experiment in class, and you are asked, was it a chemical change? Basically, the first piece of evidence that you need is, was it um, a new substance formed? So, I'm looking for, yeah, this. Most of the chemical reactions that I've done here are actually done by me lighting a match or you mixing two liquids together. Um, it doesn't have to be in liquid form. If I take this bottle of ammonium hydroxide, so this is concentrated ammonium hydroxide. Um, this is concentrated hydrochloric acid. Um, both of these would kill you very quickly. Matter of fact, World War I they used chlorine gas, mustard gas, to actually dissolve people's lungs during the war. It was really quite nasty. Okay, when I take the lids off these two bottles, you're going to actually have these two reactants, ammonium hydroxide and hydro hydrochloric acid, actually react to form a white compound called ammonium chloride and water. Problem is, I don't want to breathe either one of the reactants. So I am going to pray right now to myself, and then I'm going to take the lids off, and then I'm going to let you guys die, right? So it's no problem, no problem. Your, guys, your hearts are all right with God. You know where you're going, right? Okay, here we go. Okay, you should see a white powder form. You see? You see? You see? Look at that stuff. Yeah. Ammonium chloride, yeah, gas. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. I live again one more year. And the point is, that white substance formed, ammonium chloride, are totally different properties than these two. These two, if I drop this on my hand even, I will have a hole in my hand approximately six inches deep. So, um, chemicals can be dangerous. We need more evidence. Oh, by the way, in case you missed the point of that, the point was there was a new substance formed, right? Started off with two liquids, we ended up with something with white powder. Um, reactants consume. If you start off with a chemical, I think we did this before, right? We did this with flash paper. Um, first day of class, I grabbed the toilet paper and I said, okay, this is my reactant. It no longer exists, right? It's consumed. It's used up. So if your reactants are used up, you basically say chemical change. How about a precipitate formed? So this one would be K 
Okay, lead nitrate. And again, you know what, as you move through science, science 10 especially, when you see things in word form like this, a word equation, lead nitrate plus potassium iodide gives lead iodide and potassium nitrate, you're supposed to immediately think of actual chemical formulas. But guess what? For now, you don't need to worry about chemical formulas. I'll just demonstrate what that is. Lead nitrate looks like this, PBNO3. Um, and the other one is lead iodide. Somewhere there's lead iodide on here, right? Potassium iodide. Uh, so if I mix these two together, I should get a different substance. Okay, this is potassium iodide. And this one is lead nitrate. Whoa. So. Um, the compound that makes the yellow people is the lead iodide and potassium nitrate. Basically, you could paint the yellow lines on the road with this stuff. This is cool. Eh? This is actually a suspension. If it settles out, it'll actually go clear on the top and yellow mud on the bottom. Um, let's move on. How about a gas formed? Wow. Yeah, you see you have this sheet, right? You see it says evidence of chemical change. So for number one, you should have written new substance formed. And then to the right of it, you should have written something like that. And then for number two, you would write reactants consumed examples to the right. So right now we're on gas formed. Um, if you see bubbles, does up mean like that? Ah, gotcha. I know what up and down is. Um, I just realized that my example of a gas being formed is not in front of me. So somewhere there are keys. Do you see keys? Stevenson, oh my goodness. What did you do with your keys? People don't forget to pick up little blue things and other return things when you walk in each day because yeah, it's important. Okay, Stevenson's just looking for his keys. This gives us an opportunity for you to be the stars. Yes. Hi. This is the most amazing class of brilliant scholars, people. So now we stalking. Yeah, there we go. We got everybody. Does it go up and down? Oh yeah. Hi there, Steven. Wow. Oh, amazing, amazing, amazing. I'll go away now. Sorry. I'm looking for my keys, just in case you wonder where I've gone. Okay, I hate it when I lose my keys. It's just like bad. Where do you think I would have put my keys? Eh? Okay, um, anyhow, trust me. Um, you've probably seen Alka-Seltzer tablets, Eno tablets. Uh, little white tablet looks like a peppermint. Some people, they eat like this really spicy meal and then they got, oh my God, stomach ache. So they put this in water and it makes all these bubbles. So in labs, you know what you see for students? They will say things like, air is given off uh, when you see bubbles, right? When you see a bubble, don't immediately assume it's air. It could be oxygen, it could be carbon dioxide, but anytime you see a gas, and in this case, it's little bubbles of carbon dioxide gas, um, then you should immediately say, yes, that is evidence of chemical change. Right. One million dollars in a purple Ferrari if you find my keys. Maybe I'll sit down with my jacket, and then it could be in the pocket. Eh? Okay, it's maddening. Can't do that one. Um, yes, that's a good point. But I can't retrace all those, because then you wouldn't see me for half an hour, and you'd miss me, and that'd be all so sad. Anyhow, color change. Um, if you see an example of a change in color, 
we know we are dealing with chemical change. So, yay and behold, let me see. If I stick uh, a little bit of sodium hydroxide and something called a chemical indicator, thymophthalein, You guys, you know, you need any entertainment at a party or anything. I'm like available, right? So I can't guarantee you can drink this stuff, but I mean, it'd be like, wow. Okay, um, the funny thing is. What would How about later? Because <laughs> right now, I want to change it back. And the only way I can change it back, because this is an acid or base reaction, the base color for this chemical indicator happens to be blue in base and clear in acid. So if I add hydrochloric acid, it goes back to being somewhat clear. But then I don't want it to be clear, so I add more sodium hydroxide, which is a base. Do you guys know why you pay tuition fees? so that Stevenson can waste chemicals. Okay, let's try. That was very dilute sodium hydroxide. This is better. There we go. Worked, yes. Turn back to blue. Again, the chemical change, the evidence is just the color change. And if you see that color change, you know there's been a chemical change. Anyhow, you, of course, asked me if the dry ice would make any difference. And now I've not lost only my keys, I've lost my tongs. There they are. And my sink is now frozen shut. I tell you people what I do for... Okay, here we go. Let's find out what happens. I have no idea actually. So. When you guys go home tonight, I just have a great time. And I want you to know that I just play. And then I get a phone call about 9 o'clock. My wife wants to know, where are you? Never mind. Never mind. I'm working there. I'm working. Honestly, I'm working. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of an answer to your question, in terms of what happens when you stick dry ice it doesn't seem to have any effect on the color. So I think it's just a change of state, which would be a physical change. Right, right. We're just about there. Last one in terms of evidence of a chemical change. Um, any type of change of energy, heat given off, let's say, by a burning candle, heat pad, heat absorbed. So you can have two types of energy reactions. You can have exothermic reactions, where energy is released, heat is given off, or you can have endothermic reactions where energy is absorbed. It actually gets colder. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think what we should do is, this is a hot packer. Right? So, let's take it back here. We need Sam to tell us that this is actually just room temperature, right? Touch it, Sam. Touch it. Cold? Hot? No. Why does it say do not use on the you're not an infant, but you're not an infant. Okay, now flick that little thing, like bend it. Bend it? Yeah, the, the metal thing inside. Oh. oh, these are so cool. Okay, now hold it up. What we have is a chemical reaction. Look at that. Tell them what's happening. It's warm. It's hot. It's warm. Next time you go skiing, next time we have snow, about four years from now, um, stick two or three of those in your back pocket. Any of the opposite takes place. That was an exothermic reaction. This would be endothermic. You were suddenly playing football and you decide to run into that 400 pound guy on the line. That was a mistake. Now you're unconscious. Somebody comes out to on the field and basically goes like this and jumps up and down on it and saves your life. So we trust Sam, right? But just in case, let's put it, give it to Mr. Edge, eh? Hot, right? Yeah, boiling. Yeah. So then it's a cold pack, people. So you can have an opposite chemical reaction where you actually release energy 
uh, exothermically or absorb energy endothermically. I do have one more example of that. By the way, it doesn't have to be just heat. It could be... Put your hands underneath those. Tell us it's room temperature, right? Okay, yeah. if I mix the two of them together... And then I shake it. And then I wash my hands and make sure I don't pick my nose with that. Because that stuff will kill me. Really? Yeah. <laughs> God takes care of his own people. You don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Okay, you just play with this for a while. Tell them when it gets cold, okay? Can you not smell the You have to keep the lid on it because the gas that's given off is very concentrated ammonium. And that is not good for you, right? So, again, yeah, it's very cool. Oh, it's a me. Genius. People, when you have CO2 dissolving in water, you actually make an acid, carbonic acid, and it's actually shifting the color. Good observation. Um, okay. One last little thing here, though. I'm going to pass this around. Don't take the lid off. But this is just an example of an endothermic reaction. So I just pass it along. And I will show you Okay, the example of the giving off bubbles. I just found my Alka-Seltzer tablet. Shh. If you are ever tempted, people, to uh, put one of these on your tongue, don't. Some people like peppermints. These are not peppermints. Uh, don't put it on your tongue because what happens is it gives off carbon dioxide gas, same gas that's given off here. And what has happened in the past is it actually sticks to people's esophagus and blows a hole in it, right? So um, what it's used for is you stick it in water, and then you see all those bubbles? All those bubbles are carbon dioxide gas, just that fizzy substance you drink. You would then drink it, and that's supposed to calm your stomach, right? Okay, one more example. You've all seen these. Ladies and gentlemen, um, chemical change in the form of energy doesn't have to be heat. It can be light. Again, two chemicals reacting together. You are, again, forming light energy. So that's an, another example of a change in energy. Whoa. Ladies and gentlemen, I can think of nothing else to tell you. I am going to give you a day or two just to get these things done. Pass this around. Hey. Wow. I'm thinking about next Wednesday or something. So try to get that purple sheet done by next Wednesday. Anybody that needs to do a hot seat from yesterday?